Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I have a very special guest today. It is Natalia Wojtovich. She is the author of a really interesting book called Wargaming Experiences, Soldiers, Scientists, and Civilians. How are you doing tonight, Natalia? All right. Good evening. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm doing well. Very happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, it's great to talk to you. So you've written this book, but you have a lot of real world experience to back it up. Uh, would you like to tell us a bit about your career so far in wargaming and game design? Uh, well, I started uh, five years ago and um, I was working at NATO Civil Military Cooperation Center of Excellence, uh, which is quite a long name, but it is essentially uh, a specialized center for Civil Military Cooperation, CIMIC, and I was working in the training and education branch. And when I joined, they did not really have um, advanced uh, forms of uh, training, and I really wanted to do something active. And I did have um, passion for wargaming, so I thought that this could be a great match, and we were able to start a project to develop different scenarios and different formats of wargaming within the center. And for the next five years, it grew and we were able to do much more also within NATO itself and other organizations. So this is indeed where the um, experience started. And what I noticed um, when I was organizing my conclusions was that um, there is a lot of discussion in wargaming. It's quite a new discipline, so you do not get a very fixed point. You have to find your own way. And I wanted to write down how I did it, how I went from the first um, definitions or concepts towards plans and prototypes, uh, how I implemented simulations or war games, what were the outcomes and how were they perceived. So in a way, you get to follow me on my uh, path as a designer and to recognize how did the first war game go, how did that develop, how did they evolve, because, of course, there are different um, experiences that you can sum up and use to your advantage at a later stage. So there is a lot of comparisons and um, also anecdotes simply from real life situations that show you what are the main points to um, take for yourself. And uh, recently, um, February, March, I have uh, left uh, CCOE and I uh, went on to the Hague University of Applied Sciences. So currently I am doing more academic but also teaching work and I'm looking forward to compare it later uh, with my previous uh, time. But the book ends indeed um, at the time that I provided my last simulation on collective defense, so potential attack on NATO uh, and then triggering response from the Alliance. Uh, so that is maybe a small excerpt and um, that could be the start uh, of the book as well. <laughs> so maybe we'll get a Wargaming Experiences Part 2. But for now, so you work, as you just mentioned, in applied sciences. And one thing that struck me the most about your book was that you have a lot to say that's really interesting about arguments for and against wargaming as a useful tool to model or to simulate real life experiences. So clearly you're a wargamer, you support it. So what, um, what is your main argument in defense of wargaming against people who would say it's not that useful? Well, um, I would say reality. So <laughs> it is, of course, not a new tool, uh, but it has been uh, growing over time. That means there is something unique about wargaming that other tools do not provide. 
And in my view, this is, um, first of all, the freedom to experiment and the inclusion of human um, in its form. So most of the time we would be able to not only ask questions as in uh, formal experiments, but also you are able to capture the interactions within the system. And that is what I see if I compare, for example, a computer simulation and a simulation with a team of um, soldiers, or preferably if we can uh, make it more diverse with civilians or scientists, uh, that we see their decisions. And uh, of course, you have to see that the decisions are not always rational and are not always measurable. And an example of that um, is decision-making at the presidential level, which you cannot predict ahead of time. So it has very uh, big consequences, but it is not included in most of the formal modeling uh, without war games. And I think that this is uh, the biggest argument that we can notice what I see on the other side, if I am presenting about war games, what I um, receive in return is that uh, you cannot quantify the results. So you would say uh, maybe this particular iteration just had a madman in it or it had somebody that steered the result. But in my view, that is an outcome on its own, because you could say it's one of the uh, possible options that would develop. And as we know from history, there are many times where um, it simply depended on the decision of a one person or a group of people. And we have to recognize how does that play out. So whether you want to uh, look at it as game theory or you want to go into operations research, which is more um, about optimization, you can still take a lot from wargaming. And I think the quality of it as a tool is linked, of course, with the design and with the participants. And then this is the responsibility which uh, everybody has to take, whether it is playing for entertainment or it is playing for science or it is playing for military planning, that you have to look up to your purpose, to what you want to achieve and how to do it. So in a way, um, all of the arguments that I collected, they came up in conversations or in uh, workshops. And I noticed that um, I think it is good to take them seriously and put it into a fair perspective. So what are the potential weaknesses of wargaming and how you can counteract it? Or the other way around, um, if you notice that um, this could be somehow um, not real, then you have to flag it. And that is the transparency that I always expect. And um, as every tool, it can be used to its best potential or it can be used in the wrong way. So I am advocating for a couple of things, and that is the transparency that is as close to reality as possible. That is the um, leaning towards the truth, because in the end, in my view, Wargaming, if you use it uh, scientifically or for military purposes, it can save lives and expenditures. So that depends on the quality of the question you are undertaking. And many times you notice uh, mistakes such as starting with the answer or uh, finding if one strategy works instead of asking what strategies exist. So um, I just notice, that that's why also the book follows me a bit as an observer, as a person that is inquiring, and then as a designer, and in the end, as a leader of the project, because you have to answer these basic questions, in my view, to um, properly address wargaming and, you, and use it to the best possible uh, outcome. So basically, good wargaming design is both an examination of the possibilities that the players bring and also 
an examination of self and trying to catch any assumptions that you might have made and trying to account for what you're learning as you go through different iterations of the game? Definitely. I think those are uh, very solid functions. And um, as a, an example, once we did a reverse war game, you could say, because we took the actions that in reality were already uh, taken, and then we asked people to name the strategy that connects them. And what you could notice is there was no strategy. So it was simply a dynamic system where people were moving parts, but you could not trace it back to a plan or a strategy. And in this case, you could say that um, the question was formulated to see whether you can at all find a pattern. So it investigated um, the system. It did not say um, what kind of player would um, steer it. So I would say that there are very versatile uses, indeed next to the uh, self or the player investigation, the system, uh, the dynamics, and in the end, uh, the questions can be very broad or very specific. Uh, there was, for example, a war game that uh, compared the reaction if a um, there was a drone, so unmanned vehicle, or there was a plane that was shut down. So a group of military uh, staff would have to respond what would be their reaction. And you can imagine that uh, that creates very different um, baseline. And this you can observe very well and then ask in which scenario which response would make sense. So in a way, you are pushing the boundaries of your current knowledge and you are simulating threat, which is not very far away. It is uh, a very realistic uh, scenario. Um, so there, again, I would say that this is a tool and depending on uh, where your purpose is leading, you can uh, discover many results. Interesting. So when you talk about designing one of these war games, how rules heavy a design are you talking about? Is this something that's structured the way that somebody who picks up, say, a coin game would expect? Or is this something that's a little bit more of role playing with a mediator who helps decide how things go? Mm. Well, within the book, I describe mostly um, games that you could um, trace closer to role-playing games. And the reason is they were mostly used as exercises. So if you would be um, looking into the dynamics between uh, local people, the military forces, the insurgents, and maybe the NGOs or humanitarian organizations, and the question what can be achieved as a consensus on the basis of this for players, then you need some sorts of uh, agenda. You need some sorts of objectives. Uh, you need some sorts of shared environment. So I would say the purpose of training to this direction took me very much closer to less formal games and closer to uh, RPGs, whereas... Um, if you are speaking about questions that would be uh, closer to, for example, how much fuel has to be prepared for a given operation, then you are moving more into the resource-based and economic systems. So they would be much more structured and based on formulas. So in this case, I would not exclude any of the forms. I would say that they are... Um, it, it is very important that they are um, aligned with the purpose. So the worst thing that can happen is, of course, if you have a very specific question and somebody gives you a very broad format. So you are just wandering around instead of answering the question or the other way around. If you have a very open situation and you would be given a too specific question, you might lose the whole point altogether. And um, I saw an example of that. Um, there was a pre-deployment training and it was focused on one of the um, operational areas. And it had a lot of, I would say, fancy elements, but they were not helping to prepare 
the soldiers to deploy. For example, there was the sound of a market in the Middle East. And I can imagine for the company that made it, it was very nice because they can travel and look how the environment is uh, looking. But for the soldier that is preparing, it would be better to, for example, give them the basic uh, language skills or anthropological profiles of the population that uh, lives within the area. So it should, in the end, uh, very clearly point out what are the reasons that you have this particular design elements. And um, it should not be, let's say, a guessing game. It should be very much connected. So how long does it take to develop and research and prepare for one of these wargaming simulations? What is the what is the process of going from idea for what you need to simulate to actually having something ready to go for people to play and learn from? Well, uh, I speak in the book about the protocol, but that is, of course, uh, just the way how I approached um, the process of developing a game. And I would not say that there is a rule about time because uh, there are different factors that contribute to that. First of all, the urgency. So if there is a need for a war game that addresses something that is happening at the moment and there is no existing standard or tactics that can um, resolve it and it has to be approached immediately, then of course, um, I think the shortest time that I have myself developed a war game was uh, seven days. And I would not generally recommend it, of course, as a process to do it in that uh, manner, but that was dictated by the current requirements and urgency of the situation. Whereas um, in ideal world, of course, you could play test, um, polish, improve, upgrade, uh, change, and then shape the war game um, basically up to a couple of years, um, depending on the size of the system. Uh, so the longest uh, that I've worked on the war game was around three years, and that was on a strategic level uh, war game where you were um, trying to improve the whole region. So obviously you had to find out what uh, were the underlying reasons for the current disturbance, uh, what were the conflicts, uh, what were the forces deployed already, and um, what are the non-kinetic factors that influence the uh, problems on the ground. Uh, so that took uh, years, and the best way that I would see is that um, you start with a description of what is the purpose for the war game, and that already also tells you a bit of how long it would take to develop a solution to what you are trying to do, if that is a training problem, if it's a concept problem, if it is organizational problem. So basically what uh, is the war game destined for? Uh, because if you say uh, this is just a project for networking and social interaction, then of course it can be a simple card game played out between colleagues um, and that can be much shorter in its lifespan. Whereas most of the war games that I conducted um, improved between iterations. So we always tried to get the current mission experience, the lessons learned. So we would compare the model that initially was constructed to what is happening and to uh, the testimonies of people that were trying to solve that problem before us. Uh, and that could, of course, mean that you are constantly uh, not reinventing, but at least improving uh, what is on the table. Uh, so in a way, it, it can be years, but it can be also days, depending on the urgency and on the format. And it can also um, be determined by the end game. So what is the outcome you are looking for? If that is more analytical work, then I imagine that 
even collecting the data underlying the model will be much bigger. Uh, so in, in this um, moment, um, if I am developing a war game, uh, I would prepare between six to 24 months as a standard. Um, again, if that is not rushed by some specific requirement. Okay, so one thing you touched on in this answer is something else that you also touch on in your book, but I want to ask you about it, which is, so when we talk about wargaming, that does not necessarily mean that we're talking about war or that we're talking about troops. Wargaming as a concept can be applied to, from what I understand, corporate interests or resource management. Is that an accurate understanding of professional wargaming, at least as you've experienced it? That is uh, my understanding, <laughs> that's how I can respond, because indeed um, there are a couple of different um, factions that are commenting wargaming as a discipline. In my view, I would say it is not only gaming of war, which is the literal understanding, it is also a separate method in which you can uh, use, for example, opposing teams or different types of players. You have the underlying scenario. And you can imagine the same way that you can simulate uh, the battle of Waterloo. You can simulate the battle for the market. So you can see which competitors could dominate the coffee makers market. They could line up what are the priorities of the clients, what are the factors, as in troops, so you could say this company has headquarters and 4,000 employees and two factories, whereas the other one has six um, headquarters, but only one factory. So you would be able to compare their missions, their strategies, their culture, and in the end, who would in this simulation be um, the winning company. And I have noticed that uh, wargaming, if you use it as a method, is used indeed uh, within several other uh, topics. Um, you see it, of course, within law as um, competition in the court. You can notice it in the economic simulations. Um, you can notice it within computer science if you speak about so-called red teaming, which is playing the enemy, trying to most probably test the systems, how well they would keep up to the attacks. Um, and uh, you recognize these uh, elements within other uh, disciplines. So for me, wargaming uh, is not the gaming of war. It's the method to approach your problem, your question, your system, in an organized manner that can show you different results than you would get from your classic uh, simulations. When you design a war game, how much background experience do your expected players need to have in order to play well? Are you pitching your game towards people who are already experts in the topic of that game? And if so, you know, are your play testers equally experienced or do you play test a game with different people than its ultimate intended audience? Mm, most of the time I prepared uh, different levels of um, war game. So you could play them with zero experience. And uh, that was, for example, war games that we had for combination of military and civilian audience. So on both sides, we did not have a baseline because they both came from totally different um, organizations and totally different uh, models, mental models of how reality looks like. So we would start very um, basic without zero requirements. Uh, the most advanced games were geared towards um, the level of general. So they would have to not only possess all the knowledge or it was um, the expectation that they would already um, have uh, the view on these topics uh, and we expected decisions from them. So in a way they should be able to calculate the consequences of a given choice. 
Um, and when we showed them the comparison of the outcome with reality, then they should also be able to uh, show the reasoning uh, why this was a good choice or what could be done different. And then let's say we are on a good path to discover what could be the best way to address a given scenario. So I would say that um, there is not a rule for it. I would say there should be an opposite rule, which is uh, prepare the war game to your audience. Um, so check what is their expectations and uh, what can you do together when you are playing. Because if you are speaking about very open systems, and the question would be, for example, the day before the battle, uh, you have a choice um, to move to uh, west or east or to occupy the bridge or leave it open, then I think most people can start thinking in these terms and recognize um, what would make sense. And then the question is, what do you want to get out of it? So if you want to, for example, exercise the knowledge of escape routes, then you can show them, all right, you need these alternatives or this number of paths uh, for this amount of people, or these are the um, different issues that can occur during evacuation. But that, of course, does not require specific knowledge. On the other side, if you have people that are advanced on the topic, then, of course, you do not want to give them knowledge they already have, because that is possibly the worst situation in education because they are not progressing. So you want to give them a more challenging question. So you would say, if all the bridges have been detonated, what could possibly be done to now uh, alleviate the situation? And then they have to start thinking harder because the normal routes are not accessible anymore. So I would uh, always try to um, not prioritize the war game itself, but prioritize the audience that is participating. And in that manner, I did have um, war games that um, I would, let's say, hmm, deconstruct into smaller pieces. And there could be a group that was directly um, very much understanding and very much making decisions. So we would progress through five parts or we would have a group that did not have that confidence or that knowledge. So they would do um, three parts in the same time, which makes to me perfect sense because uh, you just want to get up to the best progress possible in the time that you have. So that, that was always my answer that I try to adjust the war game to the level and the expectations of the audience, which makes it, uh, let's say, on both sides versatile, but also um, it was probably only possible because I designed them so I could manipulate them on the spot. And that can be very difficult if the systems are either a legacy from previous um, staff or they are not updated. And then the question is how much the organization can um, invest in creating this versatile uh, solutions. So when you are playing these games, how, they are called games, but of course these also have a very professional and educational purpose. How much emphasis is put on making these games fun or in making them compelling? Do you just assume that your audience is invested and that therefore they're gonna go with it? Or are there elements that you add to these games to make them more engaging for the people who play? Mm, I would say that engagement is never a given. <laughs> it is um, always uh, on the side of the facilitator or the designer to um, try to engage uh, the players. So um, when I was delivering the war games, uh, most of the time they were a break between uh, lectures or other knowledge-based learning, which of course gave a huge advantage. Uh, but a uh, bigger effort for me started when um, the war games were either separate events, so people actively had to step off their work 
to join the war game, or they were, for example, attached to an exercise where you do physical um, maneuvers all day, and then you are still asked to participate in a war game. So you can imagine that um, you are very much responsible to bring that uh, up to the right level of engagement. And then for me, there are two answers. First of all, uh, you should indeed make it interactive. So the decisions that um, the players are making have to be meaningful and they have to feel involved. Otherwise, um, indeed, you will lose um, the participation. So I always tried um, either way to uh, make it first person or a group decision that will shape the outcome of the war game. Uh, and second part is if you are speaking about professional war games, then indeed um, they, the question behind them has to be important enough for people to engage and they have to have motivation to do so. So on one side, it is on the shoulders of the designer to choose a question that will get people moving. On the other side, the leadership has to attach meaning to this war game. Otherwise, it will not be as effective. Um, so you have to um, look that uh, on one side you are doing your job as a designer, on the other side that the war game is perceived in the right way. Um, so that can be the key to success or a very quick way to disintegrate uh, within the wargaming. And I saw both examples uh, of uh, very good outcomes or very bad ones. And uh, the biggest wargame that I led was for around 100 people. And then you ask, all right, well, how do you keep uh, 100 people engaged? <laughs> Uh, we basically um, run them against each other. So they all had the chance to win within the groups, but they had to plan out and do actions together. So that is, of course, already compelling that you can all play within the same scenario and um, you can progress. Whereas uh, I also saw a war game that um, missed the expectation so the arrangement beforehand did not provide uh, enough substance and the war game was generic, whereas the audience was, first of all, overworked. Um, so they did not enjoy the break uh, taken to war game. Second of all, because the answer did not provide them tangible results, they did not engage in it fully, which also is very understandable. So th this has to be um, always checked through and through, and um, still it, uh, it has chances for both glorious success and uh, quite a nightmare to me. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of engagement, what engages you? What is your, what is your hobby wargaming life like? What do you play for fun? Oh, I always get this question. I always struggle to answer because uh, I'm quite uh, a versatile gamer. I actually enjoy most games. Um, today, for example, um, I played Walking in Burano, which is just a small, uh, let's say, set collection uh, game. Um, I enjoy most of the board games that I'm introduced to. Uh, I also play uh, a bit of online, but I do miss then the social elements. Um, so I do basically reading, writing and gaming. That is most of my <laughs> time. Uh, and if you speak about war games, I have to say that uh, I'm more in the open camp because I really like to see mechanics uh, from other gaming uh, themes coming through. So I do like uh, very much deck building. I enjoy engine building. I enjoy civilization-like uh, progress. So for me, um, the best way to show the value of combat uh, simulations is in the bigger picture. And I do like to see that coming together. 
which I know is in opposition to, uh, let's say, very specific uh, mode of wargaming. And uh, that is also a value on its own. But I do like when it is more uh, broader. Do you find that your time as a hobbyist board gamer makes you a better designer at work? Oh, definitely. 200%. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) the reason is, um, first of all, because you interact with different uh, designs. So you see what could be a good solution to a given uh, problem, how to represent different moving parts. Uh, Second of all, if you are in any gaming community and you can bring your prototype, then the feedback is priceless. I always say that that, uh, any serious game should be played by hobby players. And that is because they have basically a database that is years and thousands games long. So they can directly tell you whether um, this has an equivalent in uh, other games or how does that compare. And they can give you an honest feedback. They can tell you how did this game play out for them. Uh, Because again, if you skip the part about knowledge building, so you say that you want to see how people interact with your system, then you have to let people in with some... Sometimes is, uh, of course, uh, tricky because that can destroy your game. But I have to say that as a designer, I very much value that part. So if you destroy it and you see, all right, this design did not work out. So maybe it was good for the purpose, but it played terrible. Then I have to start again and see what was good, bad, ugly or very uh, well received and then uh, you can always improve so this is a part that I really always stress to let people outside of um, of that discipline or that topic or that company let them in to play as well That is a great sentiment. Uh, I want to thank you so much, Natalia, for coming on this podcast. I really enjoyed interviewing you. I think, I hope my listeners really enjoyed this as well. And where can we find you on the internet if we want to talk more? Uh, Well, thank you very much for having me. It was also a pleasure. The only danger is that I can talk for hours about wargaming, uh, but (laughs) we managed to keep it uh, quite short. Uh, You can find me on Twitter, uh, indeed with my surname uh, slash N. Um, I am also on LinkedIn if somebody is there. um, And I think... You can, of course, look up the website, wargamingexperiences.com. But that is about it for my presence. Well, we will will have to ask you questions there then. (laughs) As usual, um, everybody, you can find me as Beyond Solitaire anywhere on the internet. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast and happy gaming.